A listener note, this episode contains some adult language and themes. It's 2.30 a.m. on July 16th, 2012, a steamy midsummer night in Boston. Two men, Sefiro Furtado and Daniel De Abreu, are heading home from a club in the theater district called Cure. The two are friends, both born in Cape Verde. A night out on the town has been a rare treat for them. They drank and danced. At some point, De Abreu may have spilled a drink on a big guy who was also drinking at the club. If the guy took offense, he barely showed it. Now the two friends are riding in an old BMW, heading home. They stop at a red light just outside the theater district. A silver SUV pulls up alongside them. What's up now, someone shouts, followed by the N-word. There are five shots, shattered glass, clicks of an empty revolver, chaos. Operator 219, what is the location of your emergency? Um, there was actually just a shooting, six shots, two guys in the front seat. Um, I'm not sure if they're dead. I was, I was asleep. That's Detective Paul McIsaac, Boston PD. Dispatch called him. I was sound asleep, and it's that sound, and you just know it's never good. Yeah, they go, oh. you make a phone call and get up, brush teeth, and out the door you go. McIsaac arrives at the scene to find the two friends slumped in the front seats of the BMW, lifeless. A small crowd gathers. Camera crews arrive. Police cover the dead men with white sheets. It's a drive-by, which investigators know will make it harder to solve. No fingerprints, no DNA, no shell casings. Revolvers don't leave those behind. No surveillance cameras either. Just two cars passing in the night. The district attorney's office has a prosecutor on call for homicides. Teresa Anderson has volunteered for extra weekend duty, and now she's looking at the dead men's car. It's, it's heartbreaking. You, you see people in their absolute last moment in a very violent and, um, and, and, and tragic ending, and then also know that there are people that are going to learn about this and, and be devastated. Anderson and the police begin talking to witnesses. There are clues, a description of a vehicle. A silver or gray pathfinder. Investigators needed to cast a wide net. They interview club patrons and bouncers. They check video footage inside the Cure Lounge. Picked them right off the bat. He goes, Tess Hernandez. And we said, where? And he goes, right there. And we saw him right away. Aaron Hernandez, the Patriots' star tight end, was also at the club that night. He went downstairs. Nine to ten minutes later, he came out and left. And that was the end of that. At the time, that's all it was, a throwaway observation. Here's Boston Sergeant Detective Mark Sullivan. Paul actually threw out, why don't we talk to Aaron? I'm like, no, no. The police had no reason to suspect him of these killings. It was nothing more than a cop joke about a celebrity sighting in a nightclub. Like, maybe Hernandez did it. Dea Bray, who had been a police officer in Cape Verde, he wanted to become one in the States. He and Furtado worked together for a cleaning service. Detectives found no weapons or drugs in the BMW, no evidence of criminal activity, and they struggled for nearly a year to solve the double homicide. The case went cold. Then nearly a year later came news of another murder, this time in North Attleboro, some 40 miles south of Boston. To the shock of many across the country, the suspect was Aaron Hernandez. The news reached Boston Police Sergeant Mark Sullivan, and suddenly, a light bulb went off. I was watching the news, it just hit me. I texted my squad and uh, said we have to get up on Aaron. That little cop joke about suspecting Hernandez? Not so funny anymore. From the Boston Globe and Wondery, I'm Bob Holler, and this is Gladiator an investigative series about Aaron Hernandez and Football Inc. This is episode four, The Patriot Way. By now, Hernandez has advanced from college football to the NFL. He has joined the New England Patriots as the youngest player in the league, all of 20 years old. In his first NFL seasons, he has suffered his share of injuries. A knee here, a hip there, and he has gone down with the second documented concussion of his football life. 
But there's a common wisdom in the NFL. Players get back up. They keep playing through the dizziness and the torn muscles, through the concussions. And that's what Hernandez did. He kept playing and thriving. And it paid off just weeks after the murders of De Abreu and Furtado, while detectives were seeking justice for the victims, the Patriots awarded Hernandez a $41 million contract aimed at keeping him on the payroll through the 2018 season. His agent was surprised by how smoothly the negotiations went. After all, the Patriots made the deal despite red flags, warning signs that Hernandez's own teammates had seen. Hernandez threatened to hurt a teammate over a minor slight. Other players told us about more volatile behavior. But bad behavior in the NFL is not that unusual, certainly not in Patriots history. They built that locker room around outcasts. You know, that's the business model, is to bring in players who don't have opportunities elsewhere in the NFL. That's his former teammate, Brandon Lloyd. Still, Hernandez's behavior stood out in the Patriots locker room. He later recalled telling teammates he might end up in jail someday. Yo, you know what's crazy, though? McDaniels, right? That's Hernandez talking to an NFL friend about Patriots offensive coordinator Josh McDaniels. And a couple of times, my daughter, I asked the nigga, I was like, hey, if I ever went to jail and got locked up, would you come visit me just to see what he said? The nigga was like, yeah, you know I'll come visit you. I, I love you. And I was like, all right. And he's like, why, you don't think I would? I was like, hell not. Nah. In the same phone call, Hernandez says Patriots legend Tom Brady also told him he would visit him in jail. But neither Brady nor Daniels ever did. And maybe the biggest red flag for his teammates was the friends he hung out with. It struck a number of former Patriots we spoke to. One of those friends was Alexander Bradley, a small-time criminal and drug dealer Hernandez had met through one of his former Bristol High teammates. Hernandez and Bradley hung out together a lot. They smoked a lot of weed and spent a lot of time hitting night spots. Bradley had been in Hernandez's SUV the night of the double murder. He was hanging out with these guys that I don't think were a good influence on him. This is a woman Hernandez befriended around the time of the Boston murders. She asked us not to use her real name for fear of retribution. The young woman enjoyed Hernandez's company, but she felt like he was too quick to follow the lead of the Bristol friends around him. They didn't have to try very hard at all. He was very gullible and willing to do whatever. This is my daddy. This is my brother. I'll do whatever for them. And it's like he didn't realize that he's getting himself in a lot of trouble by hanging out with the wrong people at the wrong time. One night, she rode with Hernandez and two Bristol buddies from Lower Manhattan to Brooklyn. She says she can't remember the names of Hernandez's friends or whether Bradley was one of them. I was in the front seat. And, you know, Aaron and another guy was in the back, and his other friend was driving. The back windows were open, and, she recalled, Hernandez's friend in the back seat had a gun. As they drove along Manhattan's FDR Drive... All of a sudden, out the back window, I guess they shot in the air. So the first thing I did was say, oh my God, wait, are they shooting at us or are we shooting at them? Like, what's going on? Like, you know, they laughed, you know, and they were like, oh my God, this girl's gangsta. She didn't even, she wasn't even scared, this, that, and the third. Wow, and I was pissed. I was like, basically saying like, I'll get out of the car right now. Like, don't play. Like, I will get out on the highway right now. I was like, pull over. I did not want to be a part of it at all anymore. Everything got super serious to me right then. It wasn't just that. Hernandez was smoking weed and he was snorting cocaine. It's like you want to shake someone like that. Like, how do you not know you're in a bad situation? Finally, she stopped hanging out with him altogether. He needed a therapist. He needed someone to speak to him. A mentor would have been great. And any mentor would have seen the people he was around and said, this is a no-no. This is people you can't have around. She gave up trying to keep him out of trouble, like others before her. Tom Brady was one of them. He had been caught on a mic after a game against the Broncos, who were led by Hernandez's former Florida quarterback, Tim Tebow. I'm trying to watch over Aaron and Brandon. Yeah, they're good guys. Man. They're good guys. We've got a lot to handle. Absolutely. Good luck the rest of the way. Thanks, Thanks, All right, sounds good. That's Brady saying, I'm trying to watch over Aaron but he's a lot to handle. And that was a year before that wild ride in Manhattan. At Gillette Stadium, Bill Belichick and his staff had relied on the Patriot Way to keep Hernandez in line. The Patriot Way demands players put the team first in pursuit of excellence. 
But in the case of Hernandez and others, the code seemed to apply more to what players did on the field than off it. It seemed winning was the only way. None of the mentoring took. In the winter of 2013, after the Patriots were eliminated from the playoffs, Hernandez traveled to Belle Glade, Florida. He was gonna party with a former college teammate, Deontay Thompson. He flew his close friend, Alexander Bradley, along with him. Belle Glade is a rugged town in the sugarcane fields near Lake Okeechobee. And some of Thompson's buddies were no strangers to the police. By the time Hernandez arrived, paranoia was starting to overtake him. He had been looking over his shoulder for a long time, but now he was growing increasingly fearful about the double homicide in Boston catching up to him. At one point, he spotted two men in the club who seemed out of place. He grew suspicious. They were police, he was certain. And Bradley added to his anxiety by saying they probably were tracking him because of their shared secret, the Boston murders. Yet the party lasted for days. From Belle Glade, Hernandez, Bradley, and Thompson's buddies lit out for Miami for a strip club named Tootsie's. Hernandez ran up $10,000 in charges the first night. On the second night, he and Bradley bickered. Bradley said they fought about the bar bill, then about a forgotten cell phone. When the party ended, they drove north on Interstate 95 through the darkness. The bickering stopped and Bradley fell asleep. He later would testify that he woke up, quote, with a gun at my face, right between my eyebrows. As the sun rises the next morning, the police come upon Bradley lying in a parking lot. Hey. He's Alex Bradley. Hey, Alex? He's bleeding from a bullet hole between his eyes. Yeah, but this shit hurts. It hurts too much. I don't know. It just hurts too much to talk, my man. He's still wearing a white band on his wrist from the strip club. Please just help me, sir. All right, we got the medics on the way. You don't know who shot you? No, sir. Now listen close. What they look like? Like, uh... Uh, big, big black males. It sounds like Bradley was about to say the shooter was a big Hispanic, but he changes in mid-sentence and says big black males instead. Later in the hospital, the police questioned him again. What I'm just saying is, I ain't telling on nobody. Okay, just, so you don't want to cooperate with the no investigation? Sir. No, sir. That's all you have to tell me. If you don't want to cooperate with the investigation, if I don't have a victim, I don't have a crime. That's that's up to you. Thanks. I mean, if you're, you want to get shot and you're good with it, hey, that's that's up to you. You're a big boy. Sorry, bro. Alexander Bradley was lucky to be alive, but he wasn't telling the police anything. Instead, he was going to settle the score his own way. You know it's not smart? Making the lottery the centerpiece of your retirement plan. Or using job sites that make you wait for the right candidates to apply to your job. But you know what is smart? Going to ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator to find your next great hire. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast. No more sorting through the wrong resumes. No more waiting for the right candidates to apply. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S., by the way, that number one rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over 1,000 reviews. Right now, as a listener of this show, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash G-L-A-D-I-A-T-O-R. ZipRecruiter.com slash Gladiator. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Brooklinen is one of the fastest growing betting brands in the world. They've got over 20,000 five-star reviews, and it's not hard to see why. Personally, I never realized just how much the quality of your sheets can affect the quality of your sleep, but let me tell you, I've been sleeping on Brooklyn and for just under a week now, and already the difference is incredible. I chose the Lux Core Sheets. 
because I always tend to get hot in the middle of the night and have to readjust. But with these new silky smooth sheets, I sleep straight through the night. My Brooklinen sheets are the best, most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Brooklinen.com has an exclusive offer just for listeners of this show. Get $20 off and free shipping when you use the promo code GLADIATOR at brooklinen.com. Brooklinen is so sure you'll love their new sheets that they offer a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. The only way to get $20 off and free shipping is to use promo code GLADIATOR at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code GLADIATOR. Brooklinen. These really are the best sheets ever. Aaron Hernandez flew out of Florida believing he was carrying less baggage than when he arrived. No more Alexander Bradley, which meant one less witness to the double homicide in Boston. Then, his cell phone rang. Hernandez thinks he's dead. Now he's getting a phone call from a ghost. That's Boston Police Detective Paul McIsaac. Then Bradley sent a text. You left me with one eye and a lot of head trauma, he told Hernandez. You owe for what you did. A texting war ensued, rife with threats of death and extortion. The battle raged for three months. Hernandez issued a warning. He texted, if you ever get me in trouble or ruin my life for something I didn't do, you will pay. Bradley replied, here you go threaten again. You know that don't scare me though. If you knew how geared up I am, you wouldn't even say that. Hernandez needed help with his predicament. He turned to his agent, Brian Murphy. Where Bradley was, you know, alleging Aaron's role in when Bradley was shot down in Florida, and Aaron wanted to know how to deal with it. Hernandez told Murphy someone was threatening to kill him if he didn't pay him lots of money. It was not the kind of counsel Murphy was used to giving. And you know, I said, there's really only one way to deal with those type of allegations and ask to get a, an attorney, you know, get a law firm behind you. Because I was, I was, as you can imagine, well beyond the scope of uh, an agent's capabilities, even an agent who used to work at the law firm. Hernandez soon had a criminal lawyer in Florida, and the Patriots had a player who Murphy knew was a possible suspect in an attempted murder. Murphy also knew Hernandez's life might be in danger, according to the agent's grand jury testimony, and that Hernandez had been threatened with extortion. But Murphy at the time didn't tell the Patriots or law enforcement any of this. And Bradley kept texting. He told Hernandez he had semi-automatic weapons, bulletproof vests, and a crew that ran six deep. He wrote, since you tried to end me, I will end you if you don't do what you gotta do. Hernandez turned to Ernest Wallace, another Bristol friend from his cousin Tanya's house for protection. Wallace went by hobo. He was 18 years older than Hernandez, but now he was hanging around him all the time as a personal assistant and bodyguard. Hernandez didn't stop there. He had a shipment of handguns and rifles sent up from Belglade, and he spent $110,000 on an armored car. Aaron was not one to ever really share his fear or show his fear. That wasn't the way he was brought up. Aaron always whether it was in a football game or it was off the field or in jail, I never saw him fearful. I, I really saw him sad. So in, in his mind, this was just yet another life obstacle with which to deal. I never really saw him afraid. Throughout our reporting, we've looked for moments when someone might have stepped in and prevented the violence Hernandez had yet to wreak. Anyone who might have made a difference. It's clear Brian Murphy knew at least some of the trouble that Hernandez was in following the shooting of Alexander Bradley. It's not clear he did as much as he could have. There was someone else Hernandez turned to, his coach, Bill Belichick. Football columnist Greg Bedard was gearing up to go to the annual NFL Combine in Indianapolis when he started hearing rumors. They told me that Aaron Hernandez was coming to, to talk to Coach Belichick to request a trade because he was in fear of his life because the gang that he was affiliated with when he was a kid, they wanted him to fund their drug trade and Aaron was balking and they were threatening his family. That's what I was told and I was like, holy cow. The Combine is a showcase for college players before the draft, an amateur cattle show. Current players normally have no reason to be there. 
But Dar didn't tell his editors about his tip. He wanted to keep digging. So he went about his business and headed for the combine. You know, I was hoping to get this humongous story. Aaron Hernandez is requesting a trade from the Patriots. It would be a huge story. Hernandez traveled to Indianapolis for a one-on-one with his coach. Greg Bedard didn't know it at the time, but looking back, we now know that the rumors about Hernandez probably referred to Bradley's extortion attempt. On the weekend of February 23rd and 24th in 2012, Hernandez met alone with Coach Belichick in his hotel room in Indianapolis. Murphy testified that Hernandez told Belichick he feared for his life and that he asked to be traded to a West Coast team or released. The agent later told the grand jury that Belichick responded, quote, We can't trade you. We can't release you for numerous reasons. But Dar didn't write a story about the meeting at the time. It never made it into the news. But five months later, after Hernandez was arrested, Massachusetts State Police questioned Belichick about this meeting. The coach had a lawyer with him, and the interview was not recorded at Belichick's request, but we obtained the full police report of the interview. Here's some of what Belichick said. First, that Hernandez told him he was concerned about the safety of his daughter and girl. He worried that people might potentially harm them, and that he wasn't concerned about his own safety because he, quote, had money. The police report goes on. William Belichick further indicated that Aaron Hernandez expressed interest in relocating, even though he had only recently purchased his home. In other words, the police report says nothing about Belichick telling them Hernandez had asked to be traded or released, or that Hernandez feared for his own life. And no one in the Patriots organization, including Belichick, reported to law enforcement after that meeting that Hernandez's fiance and daughter might be in danger. Nor is there any public record of anyone in the Patriots organization asking Hernandez why. Hernandez was one of a multi-billion dollar corporation's most valuable assets. No one raised a red flag. Hernandez left that meeting with Belichick. I want to say it was a Sunday night in Indianapolis. Greg Bedard was out at a bar. Not much was open. There was one bar open. Me and some other reporters walk in, and there's Aaron Hernandez at the bar. It was all pretty cordial uh, most of the time. I think at one point Aaron bought us all around. Hernandez went outside, and when Bedard looked out the front of the bar, he saw... There's a cab, it's running, and I see Aaron Hernandez standing there taking a pee on the taxi cab. Hernandez and the cab driver started yelling at each other. And all I could think was, he's going to get busted for public urination, and I'm going to have to write about this BS. So I said to his agent... That's Brian Murphy. He was there that night. Are you going to go get your boy? And he's like... No, he doesn't listen to me. Why don't you go get him? And for some reason, I thought this was a good idea, that I was going to wrangle Aaron Hernandez. Bedard went outside. I think he had finished whatever it was he was doing. And I said, Aaron, will you get inside before you get yourself arrested? And he didn't really move. And then I sort of grabbed his, I sort of put my hand on his arm, his elbow to sort of pull him a little bit. And I said, come on, Aaron, get, get inside. At that moment, Bedard saw a side of Hernandez he had never seen before. Bedard had been covering Hernandez for three seasons now. He sort of flung his arm up in the air. He started cursing me out, saying like, you know, you're you're not my dad. No one tells me what to do. Like, you know, get the hell away from me. He's F-bombing me this, F-bombing me that. Hernandez knew by then that the Patriots would not be trading him out west or releasing him. Belichick later told the state police that he offered to connect Hernandez with the Patriot security chief, but Hernandez declined. He did, however, accept another offer from the coach for the Patriots to help him find a new home in Massachusetts. Maybe he thought having a second home would be an extra measure of protection, a safe house. Text messages show that Kevin Anderson, the Patriots staff were assigned to find the new place, was confused by the request. Anderson thought Hernandez was looking for a more secure, long-term home for his fiancée and daughter. Instead, Hernandez asked him for someplace fully furnished and only for himself. He settled on a run-of-the-mill two-bedroom in an apartment complex 12 miles from his house in North Attleboro. The rent was $1,200 a month. There was no special security system. Hernandez described it to his financial advisor as his side place. He looked at several apartments, and according to Belichick's statement, rented the worst place with the least security. Until the spotlight team uncovered the evidence, 
Belichick and the Patriots had never publicly acknowledged their role in renting Hernandez's side place. The place became a hideaway for Hernandez, his Bristol friends, his drugs, and his ammunition. I dropped him off one time, and I knew he had his house in North Attleboro. His teammate, Dane Fletcher. And I dropped him off as another one of his, like, apartments that, that came out. That was his uh, trap house or whatever in the news. Fletcher called it a trap house. It later became known as his flop house. You know, again, I'm from Bozemonte. I don't know. I don't even, I don't even know what the hell a trap house is. I think he said that he kept that place just for his boys when they stay in town or his family or something. And at the time, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, you get another apartment for your family when they stay in town. Hernandez told his financial advisor to make sure he kept the place secret from his fiance, Shayana Jenkins. He texted, I don't want her knowing nothing about it. Hernandez was spinning faster out of control. From Indianapolis, he went west. He had been scheduled to work out with Tom Brady in the offseason, but he hurt his shoulder during a game in December, and it required surgery. So he went to Los Angeles to be operated on by the same surgeon who once repaired Brady's knee. Jenkins and their new baby went with him. They rented a townhouse in Hermosa Beach on a steep street overlooking the shimmering Pacific. Hernandez's shoulder surgery was scheduled for March 26, 2013. But at about 8.15 the night before... 911, may I help you? Hi, I need an ambulance immediately. Okay, what's the address? What's going on? Jenkins called 911 to report that he had put his fist through a window. He's losing a lot of blood. He cut himself. Okay, where did he cut himself? On his wrist. How old is he? He's 23. Hermosa Beach police officer Todd Lewitt was the first responder on the scene. Mr. Hernandez was intoxicated. He had blood all over his arm and hand. Lewitt and another officer interviewed Hernandez and Jenkins separately outside the townhouse. They did not search the property for drugs or weapons. Hernandez needed stitches, but he said his surgeon would handle that in the morning. And then a week later, a call came in for another incident at the same address. I was not surprised. It involved the same two people, Aaron Hernandez and his girlfriend. He was intoxicated again. He did, on the second occasion, ask if I could take him to a local bar. Lewitt says he refused. I think he tried to use the fact that we both had tattoos. Hernandez had just gotten a new tattoo. It featured a six-chambered revolver with one cylinder empty. Tattooed above it were the words printed backward, God forgives. And I know a lot about tattoos. I'm completely slaved and uh, most of my upper body. But Lewitt had no interest in making small talk with Hernandez. He didn't like his attitude. And was acting like he was a tough guy. And although I didn't know his past, there was no question in my mind that he either was involved with or involves himself around gang members. Again, the officers did not search Hernandez's townhouse. Lewitt says he thought they should have searched the place. He felt sure they would have found something. Jonathan Hernandez also visited his brother during that time in Hermosa Beach. In his new book, The Truth About Aaron, he describes finding his brother once, sitting alone on the roof of that same townhouse, holding a gun. I was like, oh my gosh. You know what? What's going on? But there... It's just there's so many things um, about that moment that are just so dark and sad and... According to Jonathan, there was a single bullet on the table, and his brother had an empty, defeated look about him. It's just like he still takes me in that moment from the expression and look on his face. That was just, I don't know how to explain it. You know, if you know someone, you know someone. And when you know someone, you see a face a certain way, you just know something's not right. Aaron was rubbing the barrel of the gun on his chin and barely acknowledged his brother. Jonathan says he wondered if the gun was loaded. Looking back, this moment haunts him. It's just so sad because that was an opportunity. I missed one for me to potentially get him to open up and express himself and share some of the things that were bothering him at that particular point in his life. Soon afterward, Hernandez left Hermosa Beach and headed east.
Back in New England, Hernandez was hitting nightclubs in Boston and Providence more often with his Bristol friends. He was getting in beefs, showing up late for practice, and running afoul of Belichick, who seemed to be tiring of him. Hernandez texted a teammate. Bill was like, what the F is wrong with you Florida boys? He was hot. They told me they were trying to let me go, but they're gonna give me one more year to straighten out. Meanwhile, the threats from Alexander Bradley continued. Brian Murphy traveled to Boston in the hope of resolving the issue. On June 6, 2013, Murphy accompanied Hernandez to a meeting with lawyers at Ropes and Gray in Boston's Prudential Tower. Hernandez's bodyguard, Bo Wallace, drove him to the skyscraper, but they left without a resolution. A week later, Bradley filed a civil case against Hernandez in federal court in Florida. A summons was issued for the Patriot Star. But four days later, he withdrew the lawsuit. On June 18th, Hernandez reached out again to Murphy. He was at his house and he just texted me that the uh, police were outside and just sitting outside his house. And so I asked him what, you know, what do they what do they want? The day before, a jogger had made a grim discovery in an industrial park near Hernandez's home in North Attleboro. Even if Murphy didn't know it yet, police had discovered strong evidence that tied Hernandez to a murder. I said, okay, you know, what is there was there anything to worry about here? Like, what's, what's the deal? And they said, no, no, nothing to worry about. Uh, and then quickly, over the next 24, 48 hours, things escalated pretty quickly. Eight days later, Aaron Hernandez would be taken out of his house in handcuffs. If you're enjoying Gladiator, here's another Wondery show you might want to listen to. Since the founding of the United States, in every generation, in every field of business, politics, sports, and society, we've watched in shock as corruption, deceit, and desire bring down heroes, titans, and those we thought we could trust. In the aftermath, we're left with too many questions. How did this happen? Who is to blame? American Scandal, a new podcast from Wondery, will answer these questions. They tell the stories of America's biggest scandals, the who, how, and why, to discover what happened, how they changed our country, and what lessons we can learn. I encourage you to subscribe to American Scandal. The first story is a look inside America's pastime, baseball, and scandal that changed the way we view our favorite athletes. It's riveting. Subscribe to American Scandal on Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to this, or find a link in the show notes that will take you there. Help spread the word, because these are stories we need to hear. Stay tuned to the end for a trailer of American Scandal. Odin Lloyd played semi-pro football for the Boston Bandits. He had been dating the sister of Hernandez's fiance, and he was last seen with Hernandez and Bo Wallace and another of Hernandez's friends from Bristol, Carlos Ortiz. Police quickly connected the dots in their case against Hernandez, and there were lots of dots. The keys to a rental car and Aaron Hernandez's name were found in Lloyd's pocket. There was incriminating surveillance tape from Hernandez's own home. The footage showed him carrying what appeared to be a gun around the time of the killing. And there was a text message Lloyd sent to his sister after Hernandez and his friends picked him up. 3.07 a.m. Did you see who I am with? No response. 3.11 a.m. Hello? His sister replies, Who? 3.22 a.m. NFL. And then a minute later, Lloyd sends his final message. Just so you know. As the police zeroed in on Hernandez, the news reached Patriots management. Bill Belichick and Patriots owner Robert Kraft wanted answers too. Belichick called Hernandez into his office the next day. He'd later tell police he asked Hernandez point blank if he was involved in the murder. Hernandez denied it, though he admitted knowing the victim. Belichick described Hernandez's demeanor as normal. He let him go. The entire exchange lasted less than five minutes. Belichick was leaving that night for a European vacation. Hernandez also assured Kraft of his innocence. He hugged and kissed the billionaire owner. I think it was that first day I sent Aaron a text and I said, 
Aaron, I'm hearing some things about, you know, you and this murderer. Columnist Greg Bedard was part of the scrum of reporters waiting outside Hernandez's house. Talk to me. You know, what's going on? There's got to be an explanation for this. He didn't answer. I said, I said, look, man, I'm outside your house. Like, you know, let's have a chat. And I know that he read the text messages, but he never answered. And at one point, you know, I saw shortly thereafter, I saw him peek out the window. And I was just like, you know, we this is a different kind of story than I'm used to covering. Bedard was still there on Hernandez's last day of freedom. It must have been five or six or seven cop cars drove in. A bunch of them went into the house. Not too long after that is when Aaron came out in cuffs, you know, underneath the white T-shirt. And that's when you realize that this was not going to probably end well for Aaron Hernandez. Patriots tight end and Bristol native Aaron Hernandez. Tonight, he is facing a murder charge. He was arrested at his home in Massachusetts today. At his arraignment this afternoon, he was charged with murder, at least how the prosecution sees it. He then drove the victim to the remote spot, and then he orchestrated his execution. The family is upset, and while they don't know any of the details, they are waiting for the facts to come out before they make any judgment. You get fanfare when you're doing good, and then when something happens, you're, you everybody wants to pull you under the bus. And he says one of the problems is there are a lot of young kids in the family who look up to them and they're not sure exactly what to tell them other than they're just going to wait for the facts to come out. The Patriots cut him immediately. Belichick returned from Europe and held a news conference. As the coach of the team, you know, I'm primarily responsible for the people that we bring into the football operation. I mean, overall, I'm proud of the hundreds of players that have come through this program, but I'm personally disappointed and hurt in a situation like this. Owner Robert Kraft was asked about it on CBS This Morning. I have to get to this only because we mentioned it beforehand, uh, the Hernandez issue, impact on the Patriot organization. Well, it's one of the saddest things that's happened in my tenure of ownership. Uh, what did you know I, about him? I mean, I think we've said doing? a lot on the issue, yeah. and uh, he, he was, everything I ever saw about him was first class in the building, mm -hmm. and um, it's a very sad thing, and it's something that, you know, I've said everything I'm going to say about it. There's uh, a trial uh, going on. and Can we talk about the Super Bowl ring with Vladimir Putin? Did you give him the ring? Did you not give him the ring? Did he steal the ring? Do you want the ring back? How do you feel about the ring, Bob Kraft? <laughs> Robert Kraft shared a little more when he went behind closed doors with a select few football writers. The Globe's Ben Volan was one of them. We're in Robert's, you know, big office at Gillette Stadium, and they made it clear no recording devices whatsoever, which is rare. I, I think that's the only time in my career I've ever had that stipulation. Usually they like recording devices because they want the quotes to be accurate, but... Volan remembers Kraft saying... I'm speaking against the advice of my attorney, but I really felt this was important. And then he made it very clear that he felt he was duped that he thought Aaron Hernandez was a good guy or a, someone who was turning his life around, that Aaron Hernandez would look him right in the eye and, and always greet him with a kiss on the cheek and would always tell him, you know, thank you, Mr. Kraft, for showing me the Patriot way. Kraft wanted to make very clear he had no idea about any of this at all, not a clue. He wanted it to be known that he was duped and he, he definitely used that word uh, multiple times. And he, he, he said he was as shocked as anyone about Aaron Hernandez. Greg Bedard was surprised, too, at the turn of events, and he still wonders to this day. Why didn't I report his gang ties, you know, back in 2010? Why didn't I dig harder on the combine meeting with Belichick? If I would have dug a little harder and if I would have written that story, who knows? Maybe that would have clued the Patriots in. Maybe that would have woken Aaron Hernandez a, a little bit more, that he was... People knew what was going on and he was being watched and maybe he's a little bit more careful. I don't know. I mean, these are all the questions that I continue to this day to ask. When Bill Belichick addressed the team after Hernandez's arrest, teammate Dane Fletcher was there. He remembers the coach saying, It's not going to be spoken of. It's Aaron was released on this date. You know, the, um, he is not part of this team. He will not be you know, spoke about in this locker room. Um, you know, it, it was kind of that understanding with everybody, and we all knew it, you know. Aaron Hernandez 
was no longer a patriot, no longer their problem. It's a distraction, and we were always there for a better common purpose. We're, you know, we're on to the next one, as Belichick might say, and we are, we're going for, you know, a championship. That was the Patriot way. Oh, yeah, nobody would believe me. Nobody would believe us, yeah. We'd tell people, like, involved in the investigation, and they were like, no way. Like, yeah, this is it. With Hernandez's arrest, the Boston detectives assigned to the South End double homicide case took a fresh look at his movements that night. They went back to the surveillance footage. Previously, you'd watch it, and you see Aaron leave an hour, an hour and 15 minutes before the victims leave. Now, we're just focusing on Aaron. And just following Aaron. We had the same video to follow our victims and survivors. We used everything the same to backtrack and follow him an hour and a half earlier. And then it all starts falling into place. Sergeant Mark Sullivan called his lieutenant to alert him. And before it starts, starts blowing up in the media, I, I call his personal cell phone and I just laid, laid it out to him. Detectives found an SUV matching the description of the gunman's vehicle. It was stashed in a garage at Hernandez's cousin Tanya's home in Bristol. Police got a warrant and searched it for gun residue. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. Hernandez is a professional alley place for the pages. Nobody wants to believe this. No one's gonna believe us. The following May, while he waited to stand trial for Odin Lloyd's murder, Aaron Hernandez would also be charged in the killings of De Abreu and Furtado. If he were convicted on just one count of first-degree murder, Aaron Hernandez would spend the rest of his life in prison. Yeah, man, I'm just chilling, man. Trials in January, shit looking good. Talking about lawyers today, shit looking real good. They don't have, they know how they do shit for me, so they don't got what they got to, you know what I'm saying, to, to, to get, find me guilty for me. So like, and they know I'm innocent, yeah, but. Yeah, no way, bro, you innocent, bro. I'm you innocent. Innocent. Wrong, bro. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the jury, but my, my lawyers feel real good about that shit, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I'll be good regardless, man. I'm a soldier, you know what I mean? That's on the next episode of Gladiator. From the Boston Globe and Wondery, this is part four of six of Gladiator, an investigative series from the Spotlight team about who could have made a difference in the life of one young man. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, NPR One, and every major listening app as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. Please support our show by supporting them. And thank you. We'd also like to learn about you. Please complete a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. That's Wondery.com slash survey you'll have an opportunity to tell us what you like about this series. Jonathan Hernandez's new memoir about his brother is called The Truth About Aaron. Gladiator was written, reported, and hosted by me, Bob Holler, and by Beth Healy, Sasha Pfeiffer, Andrew Ryan, and our Spotlight editor, Patricia Wen. We'd also like to give special thanks to Globe editors, Brian McGrory, Scott Allen, Mark Morrow, and Janice Page. Spotlight's data specialist, Todd Wallach, and reporter, Maria Kramer. Gladiator was produced by Amy Padula. Sound designed by Jeff Schmidt. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louis, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery. And here's the trailer to American Scandal. Good morning, and thank you for joining me. Every scandal begins with a secret. Good evening, my fellow citizens. But I want to say one thing to the American people. 
a lie. I had no prior knowledge of the subsequent and illegal. A denial. And I just like to remind you all. I have been cooperative. That I'm innocent. I did not. I have never. I've been accused of something I'm not guilty of. But the truth will out. Those new bombshell allegations Breaking against this hour, Hollywood new allegations allegations are are obtained exclusively by this show. And then, in the past few days. I've begun to atone for my private failing to apologize to my team. I'm embarrassed and ashamed. I'm deeply sorry for my irresponsible and selfish behavior. Looking back at the history of this case, two questions arise. How could it have happened? Who is to blame? Well, let's find out. From one the network behind Dr. Death and Business Wars comes a new podcast about our most shocking scandals. I'm Lindsey Graham. On my new series, American Scandal, you'll hear stories from the world of sports, politics, business, and culture. A doping ring, a corrupt state capital, a disturbing betrayal of public trust. American Scandal premieres on September 18th. Subscribe today on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now.